Hey, what's up, Next Gen? I want to talk to you about our second week in our series, Break It Down. That's all about how to better read and understand the Bible. So this week, I want to talk about three different tools that you can use as you begin your journey of, of understanding and reading the Bible. The Bible can be a really confusing book to read. In fact, when I was in middle school, I would often leave my time reading the Bible feeling super frustrated and angry even because I just didn't understand what the Bible was trying to communicate. So, three tools to help you understand what the Bible is saying. You ready? Here we go. It's all about genre. Now, what is a genre? A genre is like a different classification or categories of something. So like different genres of movies include action movies, children's movies, fantasy movies, etc. Different genres of music include hip hop, country, classic rock, classical music, etc. And there's also different types of literature genres. Um, for example, there's like history books, there are fiction, non-fiction, historical fiction, biography, fairy tale, fantasy, sci-fi, and the list can go on and on. And the Bible, though it is one big book, it's made up of 66 smaller books, and each book has a different genre. So here are three main genres in the Bible. Number one, narrative. Number two, poetry. And number three, is discourse. Now here's what happens if we approach the Bible thinking that it's one genre when it's really another genre. Think about it this way. What if you're reading a fairy tale like Hansel and Gretel, but you thought you were reading a historical textbook? Man, you'd be pretty lost and confused, right? And hate to break it to you, but um, you know, houses made out of candy actually don't exist, though I personally wish they did. Or what if you were reading a biography about Abraham Lincoln and you thought it was a mystery novel? Man, so sometimes we get confused when we go to the Bible because we think it's one genre when really it's another. So let me explain to you what these three genres that I'm talking about are to help you give a, a better understanding for when you approach the Bible. So the first genre is narrative. And narrative is a story. So think of books like Genesis, or Exodus, or Joshua, or even the Gospels with stories about Jesus' life like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now when we look for a story, when we're reading a story, we're, we're looking for things like the plot, and the climax, and suspense. We're looking at characters, and antagonists, and protagonists, and the settings, and all those things so that we can understand what is this story trying to communicate. See, oftentimes we read stories in the Bible and we instantly, we look at one verse and we think of how does this apply to my life? Well, we really need to read the whole story and then ask, what is this story trying to tell me and how do I apply that to my life? Let me give you an example of how sometimes we do this the wrong way. See, in Genesis chapter 4 verses 8, it, it tells a story of, of Cain and Abel. And, and it says that, that Cain says to his brother, let's go out into the field, and Cain then kills his brother Abel. It's this like, tragic story in this tragic verse, but if we're thinking, how does this verse apply to my life? Uh, what what do, we, do we take away, well, I should kill my little brother? No, because, no, that's not true. We shouldn't copy everything that people in the Bible do, right? But we need to understand what the whole story is communicating. The story is talking about how sin ruins life and ruins humanity. It's a very, very sad thing, right? But we need to understand the whole story before we ask how it applies to our life. So that's the first genre, narrative. The second genre is poetry. And poetry is often a thing that can be very confusing, but instead of saying something straight up, um, like, hey, I like you, uh, poetry attempts to say something in more of a creative and expressive way, like, instead of, hey, I like you, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Right, the, the, the famous classic poem. So how does this play out in the Bible? Well, in Psalms 23, we see that, that the, the psalm starts out by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. 
Now, if we were to read that literally, we would think, well, God isn't a literal shepherd. No, that is very true. God is not a literal shepherd. He does not have a literal flock of sheep that he leads around. We are not sheep. No. This poem is communicating something in a creative way, and, and it's communicating that and God loves us, that he cares for us, that he leads us and guides us and wants the best for us. So when we approach poetry in the Bible, we need to make sure that we understand that there's a poem that's trying to communicate something in a creative way, and we need to be able to understand what the point the poem is trying to make before we apply that poem to our lives. Poetry in the Bible happens in the book of the Psalms, it's all about poetry. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Habakkuk, a lot of those uh, prophetic books are poetry. And even in Genesis, which is a narrative book, often has poems scattered throughout. So that's our second genre. The third genre is discourse. Now the best way for me to describe discourse to you is like an essay. So maybe you started writing essays in school and you're probably rolling your eyes already. But what an essay does is it's trying to communicate and convey a specific point. Maybe it's trying to persuade or argue a certain point. And so in the Bible, there are these discourses or these essays where people are so convinced about some sort of truth about who God is or who Jesus is and how we're supposed to live that they write in this very persuasive way to try to get people to live differently. For instance, in the book of Romans, the book of Romans is 16 chapters and it spends the first 11 chapters convincing the reader of what Jesus has done for us. And then chapters 12 through 16 says, because of what Jesus has done for us, now we are supposed to live a different way. It's this very persuasive type of writing. So when you come to books like Ephesians or Galatians or Philippians or Titus or the book of Jude, all those small little letters, those are discourse essays. Those are letters that people are writing to persuade a specific point. So before we take one verse and try to apply it to our lives, we need to see what the whole thing is trying to say to us and then apply that principle to our lives. I know this is a lot of information, but I hope that this is helpful for you as you begin your journey of, of diving into God's word. My challenge to you is to be curious about the Bible. Yes, it can be confusing and hard to read, but it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It is the way that God has chosen to communicate with us. And it is this amazing book. So be curious about it, ask questions, and dive into your own Bible journey. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one.